Hi, everybody. In this video, we'll discuss the timeless work of Dante Alighieri, the Divine Comedy. This work has perhaps more than any other shaped the Catholic imagination. This course is about the Catholic intellectual tradition. We saw in the first week that intellectual here doesn't just mean ideas in the sense of um, analysis or concepts. It also has to do with the will and desire. Dante's work, more than maybe any other that we'll read in the course, speaks to those faculties of ours, our, our will and our desire. In his work, The Divine Comedy, he lays out a kind of map of the whole cosmos, uh, according to the 13th century, uh, again, Catholic imagination, and uh, depicts the journey of a soul through that, that cosmos. Um, what we're going to do in the lecture is lay out the structure of this world that Dante portrays. We're going to walk through its plot, and we're going to look at a few key passages selected from our reading of this prose translation of Dante's uh, Commedia, as he called it. The actual title of the work was just Commedia, uh, but it was so beautiful that a later commentator gave it the uh, the appellation gave it the adjective divine, and so it became La Divina Commedia, or for us, the Divine Comedy. So let's, uh, let's get to it, friends. Here is Dante uh, portrayed with, a, with an image of his work. Uh, usually it's collected in several volumes. In this case, we have just one volume. Um, it unfolds in three parts, as we will see. Also, I comment on Dante's uh, headpiece here, the laurels. Uh, the laurel is a symbol of triumph, a symbol of poetic brilliance. Um, and Dante, uh, who was regarded as a writer of great poetic brilliance, um, is sporting it here um, in uh, indication of that fact. Dante Alighieri, <clears throat> citizen of the city of Florence, lived circa, the C means around, uh, 1265, died in 1321. So he lived in the 13th and into the 14th century. He was a supporter in the political disputes of that time, of a group known as the, the White Guelphs. There were White Guelphs and Black Guelphs. Um, he, as a White Guelph, uh, wanted to check the power of Rome and of the Pope. We won't be getting a great deal into the political circumstances here. Um, however, uh, those circumstances were really important uh, in Dante's composition of this poem, both in the fact that he wrote it at all um, and in what he chose to include. Um, he was exiled in 1302 due to his political beliefs, and he never returned to the city of Florence, although it remained large in his imagination throughout his life. In a way, this work, the Divine Comedy, as we see on the slide here, was a way to critique Italian politics, um, as I say, in the form of a grand vision of the soul's journey. So here's a guy. He is exiled from his beloved home, hometown, home city, right? And he's writing this massive poem. Some of the characters that he includes in the poem, um, not uh, in the passages that we were assigned for the class, but in, in several places, are people he knew, <laughs> people he knew uh, from Florence. Um, spoiler, a lot of them get uh, placed in hell. <laughs> Certainly a commentary on Dante's part. One of the crucial uh, backstory elements that you need to understand what Dante is doing in this poem is uh, to, to know about his relationship um, or his kind of relationship with a, a woman, a person known as Beatrice. And Beatrice here is, is depicted along with Dante, and Beatrice is flanked by a couple of her, uh, of her friends. This is, of course, a, a later picture from the style, it looks like maybe from the 19th century. This relationship between Dante and Beatrice has the status of an archetype. An archetype is, is almost like a, a fundamental kind of relationship, right? This is the relationship of a poet to his or her muse, right? Beatrice is here almost in the role of muse. She is inspiring Dante's writing of this. Um, Dante met Beatrice only very briefly 
as a, as a young person. Uh, but the vision of her and the several encounters they had remained with him, and she becomes for him the source that is drawing him through, the, the companion who will ultimately accompany him all the way to the vision of God at the end of the third book of the Divine Comedy. Um, Dante <clears throat> uh, was uh, had a tragic relationship with her. In fact, uh, she ended up marrying another uh, person, another man, and uh, in dying at quite a young age. So at the time that she figured into Dante's poem, she was no longer living. Dante really was inspired by the memory of this character, Beatrice, about whom we'll say a bit more later on. But this is a driving, uh, the driving element of the whole poem is the, um, the desire he has for Beatrice, but it's not only sexual desire, right? That there is initially a component of that, certainly, but that desire for Beatrice is purified, as it were, as you move through the poem. Right? So it begins as this kind of, we say, almost like carnal desire, right? Uh, but it is, uh, over the course of the poem, it becomes a means for Dante to r rise to higher and purer desires. And that purification of desire and will is one of the main messages of the poem. The Divine Comedy, <clears throat> again in three volumes, as you can see here on the slide, was written in Dante's dialect of Italian, uh, Tuscan. Um, and it helped to establish that Tuscan dialect as what we know today as modern Italian, right? Dante really did for Italian what Shakespeare did for English. Um, these poets almost imagined the language that we speak today uh, in important ways. <clears throat> In the second point here, we have the comment that the Divine Comedy is sometimes called the Summa in verse. Now that uh, characterization should make some sense to you after our discussion last time of Thomas Aquinas. Um, Thomas Aquinas, remember, the author of the Summa Theologiae, where he attempted to collect together into a single work all that had been thought and said <laughs> that was true um, about God, about theology. Dante here is, is similarly synoptic in his aims, right? He wants to portray the entire journey of the soul from being lost in the opening canto, as we call it, of the Inferno, the first volume of the Divine Comedy, all the way to the vision of God in the concluding cantos of the Paradiso, the third volume. The three long parts of the Divine Comedy uh, I've already named two of them here, uh, are the Inferno, the Purgador, Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. So these translate roughly as hell, purgatory, and heaven. Um, they are divided into segments known as cantos, um, cantos, cantos, I'll call them cantos. Um, the Inferno has 34 cantos, um, but the Purgatorio and the Paradiso have 33. The number 33 is significant because it recalls the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a, a kind of perfection about the number 33 here. Um, altogether, there are 100 cantos then across the three volumes, but the, the imperfection, uh, 34 instead of 33, was uh, placed by Dante in, in the Inferno because, you know, it's hell, right? So you get this, this perfect number of 100 um, divided across the three works, but the imperfection is placed in hell significantly. In this image, um, and portion of this is, is used as our image um, for this course, the Catholic intellectual tradition, depicts Dante with all three of the realms uh, portrayed in his great work, The Divine Comedy. So to the left, we have the Inferno, uh, with souls descending down through what we will see are the circles of hell. We get that phrase, circles of hell, from Dante. In the middle, you have the Purgatorio, this gate that leads you up and up and up the stories, the seven-storied mountain of Purgatory to what is called the earthly paradise. And remember, if you know your Bible, you will know that the earthly paradise is the Garden of Eden, from which humanity fell, right? We saw this in Augustine. The fall uh, led us 
to inherit original sin. Right? And it's original sin that puts us in the inferno or even necessitates that we climb the mountain of purgatory. So once you have purified yourself, you've purged purgatory, purged yourself of those um, impure desires, you are fit to return to that earthly paradise, the peak of the mountain of purgatory, and from there to ascend to our third realm, depicted here in the spheres above. Um, these are the spheres of the heavenly realm, the paradiso, um, culminating ultimately in the vision of God. All about all of this um, in a moment as, as we go on. Um, Dante, of course, here depicted in the center, and to the right is beloved city of Florence. You see there the Duomo. Uh, this is the famous church at the center of Florence with the very beautiful marble facade. Um, Dante, as I mentioned before, never lost his, his desire for, his love for his native city, um, even though he was exiled and never returned. So what I want to do is walk through just the structure of the three parts, the Inferno, the Paradiso, uh, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. Right? So we're going to start with the Inferno, uh, go on to the other two, and just give you a sense of the structure. Um, then we'll loop back and we're going to walk through the plot of each of these. Um, not, of course, in their entirety. This is a very long work, uh, but focusing on the sections that you've been assigned. And, and those sections, um, as you can imagine, have been chosen uh, by myself uh, with an aim to give you uh, a sense for each of those three works. So. Inferno depicts hell, as we have on the slide here, is composed of nine circles, nine circles of hell. Each of these corresponds to a certain thin or condition of the soul, right? There's a tenth part of hell, that's where Satan is, that's the, the very bottom of hell. So in hell, we're going down, 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 right? Each of these circles takes you deeper into hell. Um, the, the hottest part of hell is in fact at the surface. Um, for Dante, importantly, and we'll see this in just a moment, the center of hell is frozen, frozen. So Satan, who is at the center of hell, is depicted by Dante as encased in ice. Right? This is different from how we often think of hell. Why? Because God, the source of light, the source of heat, the source of goodness, truth, and beauty, is above the further you move from God, it's not that things are getting hotter, things are actually getting colder. Right? And this recounts also, or re recalls also, what we learned about Augustine's view of evil, namely that evil is like cold in being an absence of heat, an absence of the good, rather than being um, some kind of positive thing on its own. But uh, about all of that, as we go here. Um, the, the nine circles, I'll just list them here. On the next slide, we'll have a little more information. So we start with limbo, um, and the, these are the, uh, these are the uh, we'll see they're called the, the heathens uh, in our, our selection, or the, the pagans, noble pagans who were never Christian, um, and therefore were unable to ascend uh, purgatory and, and enter paradise. Um, but they're also not in hell in the sense of being punished. Right? So we'll meet them first. We move then on through um, several of the uh, so-called seven deadly sins, um, lust, gluttony, plot, pride, and wrath. Remember, we're going down, 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 down. Uh, and then heresy, which is speaking against the truth of the gospel or the truth taught by the church, uh, violence, fraud, and treachery, uh, which is the ninth circle, the deepest of the circles of hell, um, leading on to that tenth so-called circle or the, the center of hell where Satan is. Uh, we see these depicted here um, on the slide, and you can pause and, and, and take a look at this if it's helpful to you, and thanks to whomever produced this image. Uh, it's taken from the, the interwebs. Um, We'll take a look at just the first and second circles of hell in our comments here, um, and you've also seen those, of course, in the reading assigned for this week. This is a depiction um, earlier than, than the previous one of Dante and Beatrice uh, of these circles of hell. Um, you can't see very much detail on 
the slide here, but you can see the gist. I would propose you start off with the at the top, this greenery. I mean, this is the earth, right? Dante is just living his life on earth, like all of us. Um, but then he enters this this journey. He crosses this river, uh, as it were, into, or there is a river in, in, in the poem. He crosses that into hell and begins his, his downward journey. The circles get smaller and smaller and smaller until you hit the center. And, and there you can see, depicted on the slide, um, Satan at the very bottom. <clears throat> so, Again, we're going to return to the Inferno um, to actually look at the plot, but I, we're just looking at the structure. So we've had the nine circles of hell going down, right? but now we're going to have the seven um, stories, and it's like stories of a building, right? The seven stories of the mountain of Purgatory. So, um, Purgatory is dep depicted as a mountain. Dante's got to go up this mountain, right? Before the ascent begins, there's an anti-purgatory. Anti here doesn't mean anti, like against. It just means like an antechamber, like a room before you get into the room. Um, and there you find negligent rulers and the excommunicated, the lethargic, or the unabsolved. So here, just as in hell, where you start with the kind of virtuous pagans who weren't able to, you know, make it all the way into uh, on that journey up to heaven, um, but aren't actually being punished. Um, here you have also this this kind of zone of purgatory uh, where people are who who are not making the ascent um, up this mountain. Um, the idea is that just as Dante is making the ascent up this mountain, so too are all of the people uh, on this mountain of purgatory um, purging themselves of these impurities that are preventing them from moving on to the Paradiso, on to heaven. Um, it's a significant thing to mention that in Catholic thought, um, purgatory, which is not shared with um, some other Christian communities, um, some Christian churches do not um, teach that there is a place called purgatory. Um, for the Catholic Church, if you die and go to purgatory, you are guaranteed to go to heaven, right? Purgatory is a way station. It is a stopping place. You're undergoing purgation. You're undergoing purification. And from there, uh, you will eventually, as, as we say, see God in heaven. Whoop. I forgot to talk about the bottom. I love the structure here. I love the structure. So there are three different kinds of love depicted here, right? Because if you're in hell, <clears throat> problem is that you didn't love, right? You're engaged in maybe, maybe certainly a love of, of the wrong thing, right? Um, here you have um, love, but it's of the wrong kind, or it was somehow not developed um, in, in such a way as to enable you to go straight to heaven. We have perverted love, defective love, and excessive love, right? So perverted love, the proud, the envious, the wrathful. These are people whose intentions were good. They're in purgatory, right? They're not in hell. But their love is perverted, is twisted in some way. It's directed toward the wrong thing. If it's pride, it's love of self. Or envy, it's love of something that someone else has that you want. Wrath, um, the same kind of thing. Your, your passion is driving you um, to, to act wrongfully in your expression of love. Defective love. The fourth story of the mountain of purgatory is for the lazy. You didn't have enough love, right? And excessive love, the greedy, the gluttonous, the lustful, you had too much. Um, so again, we see here in the structure of the Purgatorio, Dante's really careful construction of this poem. Um, in this image, um, you can see, <clears throat> just in our, our artist's depiction, uh, where, you, where you begin down here by the, by the beach, and you head up the, the mount of purgatory, and you end at the Paradiso Terrestre, the, the terrestrial paradise. And our third volume is the Paradiso. And then we'll loop back and have a look at the plot of these books. Uh, the Paradiso is uh, about heaven, depicts heaven as composed of nine spheres. So we had nine circles of hell, seven stories of purgatory, and now nine spheres of of heaven, right? These correspond to the astronomy of the time. So there was some interest on Dante's part in, in making this, uh, this account realistic, right? It was believed that the, um, what well, we'll take a look on the next slide, the, um, 
the um, <clears throat> what would it be the rotation of the planets uh, there were understood to be nine spheres nine trajectories of the the sun and stars uh, or the sun and the planets at that time um, each of these um, celestial bodies let's say uh, corresponds with uh, people who are more or less kind of pure and and, and ready for this complete vision of God that, that takes place at the very end. We begin with, with the moon, um, representing the inconstant, or people who made vows but didn't keep them perfectly. Right. Mercury, the ambitious, those who did right chiefly for glory. So you, you d it's kind of like the selfish altruist, right? You did the right thing, but in part you did it because you wanted people to praise you, right? So you did the right thing, uh, but you're not, in heaven, you're not uh, as close as possible to God. Uh, but you did make it into heaven. <clears throat> Venus, for lovers, um, deficient in temperance. Okay, <laughs> You loved too much, in a way. You loved the right thing, but just too much. Um, and then the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, representing the f uh, four uh, of the great virtues of, um, of Dante's time. And the fixed stars, faith, hope, and love. Um, so the fixed stars... Are, are people who practiced the so-called theological virtues. They practiced faith and hope and love. And finally, the prima mobile, the first mover this means, this is uh, corresponding to the angels um, and takes us back to what actually Thomas Aquinas was talking about in the Summa, right? God is called the, the prime mover, um, and that that is what appears here. Finally, you have what is called the Empyrean, and, and this realm of the Empyrean is where uh, one has a vision of God, God's self. Right? And that's what we'll come to at the end of our discussion. And here's an, an image uh, from a little after that time um, depicting these circles uh, of the movement of the moon and the planets, um, which Dante uses to structure his uh, Paradiso. So, <clears throat> I say characters, I've only listed four people here. Of course, there are dozens, dozens, hundreds of characters in this poem by Dante. This is, this is a, a rich work. It's, it's the whole cosmos set into poetry. We're going to just mention four. First, Dante himself, right? We distinguish between Dante the poet and Dante the pilgrim. So Dante the poet is writing the work, right? But Dante the pilgrim is the character corresponding to Dante the poet in the work, right? So whereas Dante the poet has the whole view of the whole thing, he's writing it, Dante the poet, uh, Dante the pilgrim, the one who is on this journey, is depicted as undergoing uh, transformation uh, throughout that journey. Beatrice um, is, as I mentioned before, Dante's great love. She died when he was only 25. Um, she will accompany Dante on the second half of his journey. So in the Purgatorio, when Dante has reached a certain height on that mountain of Purgatory, he's met by Beatrice, who is in heaven, right? But she's come down to meet him in Purgatory and then accompany him up through those nine spheres of heaven. Now, prior to meeting Beatrice, she, uh, Dante is accompanied by Virgil. And you'll meet Virgil in the very earliest pages of our of our sex, uh, selection from the text. I mean, Dante meets Virgil almost right away in the Inferno, in the very opening cantos of that poem. Virgil was a great poet. Dante had read a lot of Virgil, and uh, Dante is amazed to meet Virgil, and, and Virgil offers to accompany Dante, to lead him, really, through the nine circles of hell, and then up to the point in purgatory where Virgil can take him. What's the symbolism here? Virgil is representing literature, right? Art, um, the, the expression, uh, the use of language. Uh, Dante, the poet, the author of this work, is reminding us that language and ideas can take us to a certain point, but cannot take us past that point, right? And this recalls what we've seen earlier in the course, that for the Catholic intellectual tradition, reason can take us up to a certain point. But beyond that point, you need will, you need desire, you need purity of heart, right? Faith uh, can uh, follow reason, right? Uh, so you start from faith, you pass through reason, but then you end with faith again. So in the same way, Dante meets Virgil, takes him half of the way, but then Beatrice 
has to accompany him the rest of the way. Um, and then finally, because <clears throat> um, Beatrice represents Dante's desire, his desire for God, right? In the Paradiso, we meet one final character, which is worth, um, who is worth noting here, and that's Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, a um, person who was an actual historical person. Dante would have heard of him, lived before Dante. But he was known as, uh, well, he was a Cistercian monk. Um, he was important in the order of Saint Benedict, the, the Benedictine order. And it was Bernard who really popularized devotion to the Virgin Mary. He was known as a very holy person and had a lot of influence on Catholic piety. So Dante is first accompanied by Virgil, reason, language, right? He's then accompanied by Beatrice almost to the very peak, right? And does end up um, with Beatrice in the end. But for that final vision of God, he has to go even beyond the, the form of his earthly desire altogether to, you know, the, the vision of the Virgin Mary who appears in the poem and then to God himself. So it's Bernard who accompanies Dante on that very last stretch of the journey. So <clears throat> let's loop back. So we've got the picture now of the Inferno, nine circles, the Purgatorio, seven stories, and the Paradiso, nine spheres, right? This is Dante's cosmos. This is the journey that he undertakes. Let's now take a look at Dante the Pilgrim and meet him at the very beginning of his journal here, uh, journey here. We're going to uh, focus just on the passages that were assigned for the class. So we begin with Dante lost in a dark wood midway through life. Right. We're going to look at a passage about this in just a moment, but let's comment on this. Right? What's happening? So Dante, first of all, remember he's exiled from his native city. He's lost. He's midway through life. He's kind of middle-aged for the time, and he doesn't know what to do, right? He feels he, he can't go forward. He can't go back. He doesn't know how to make progress in life. So certainly for most of us, most of the time, this should be a familiar feeling. We, we're, we're vexed. We're troubled. We're not sure what to do. This is represented for Dante by three animals that he meets early on, the three beasts, so-called the leopard, the lion, and the wolf, right? And these represent lust, pride, and greed, and he can't get past these three things. Um, but Beatrice, we're told, has seen his plight, right? So she's no longer living. She's in heaven. She's looked down from heaven, and she's like, oh, poor Dante, he's stuck, he needs some help, right? So Beatrice has sent Virgil. Virgil was in limbo, in hell, so right next to where Dante is currently right, in the world, um, and said, hey, Virgil, I'm paraphrasing, um, go help Dante, right? Because he's stuck and trapped and doesn't know how to move forward. And that's where the journey begins. Virgil meets Dante, saves him from these beasts, and begins uh, to accompany him on his journey. Here we have a really beautiful image. I love, I love this image. This is from William Blake um, with the three animals um, that Dante faced, uh, lust, pride, and greed. Um, and it's worth just reflecting on that, right? If we are prideful or lustful or greedy, these things inhibit this is the Catholic intellectual tradition speaking, right? These things inhibit your progress on the spiritual path. If you're, if you're entrapped by those things, you can't move forward. You can't get past them. They've cornered you, right? So you need to be freed from them. Here we have Beatrice depicted on the slide. She is, as it were, you know, beckoning Dante to go on this journey, um, and he will, you know, escape these animals and encounter Virgil. The actual text is worth noting here. In the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood where the direct way was lost. Doesn't know what to do. It is a hard thing to speak of how wild, harsh, and impenetrable that wood was so that thinking of it recreates the fear. It is scarcely less bitter than death. But in order to tell of the good that I found there, I must tell of the other things I saw there. So here we have our opening lines of the poem in our prose translation, which I hope was understandable for you. It's, it's worth noting here, too, as we begin to read the prose. So Dante's work, 
Um, I, I should have put this earlier on the slides. Um, so remember, we have the 100 cantos. They're divided 34, 33, 33 across the, the three books. Um, but each canto um, contains uh, triplets, um, three-line combinations um, known in Italian as terza rima. Uh, and so unless you're reading it in the original, it's, it's hard to fully appreciate the, the rhyme scheme. Um, and, you know, different translations attempt that in different ways. I, I've given us the prose translation because I'd like us to focus just on the story, the narrative, the message, rather than the literary quality of the work. But that is yet another level beyond the three works divided across 33 cantos. Each canto is composed of these th three-line couple. Uh, you wouldn't have a three-line couplet. You'd have a three-line triplet, right? Terza rima is the style um, of the original Italian. Above, <clears throat> so now Dante's met Virgil. You saw this in the reading, right? And Virgil has convinced him to go. Dante was a little nervous at first, but okay, he's going to go, right? Because Beatrice is beckoning him forward. Um, and we read above the gates of hell these very famous lines. Through me, the way to the infernal city. Infernal, inferno, hell, right? Through me, the way to eternal sadness. Through me, the way to the lost people. Justice moved my supreme maker. I was shaped by divine power. Hell was shaped by divine power, by highest wisdom, and by primal love. Hell was shaped by love? Before me, nothing was created that is not eternal. And eternal I endure. Forsake all hope, all you that enter here. In the Catholic tradition, I mean just intellectual tradition, if you go to hell, if you are in the inferno, you don't graduate to the purgatorio and then graduate to the paradiso. This is eternal. It means it's outside of time, right? So when you are, when you choose that, you choose to separate yourself from God, you choose to love things other than God, you go to hell, right? You exist with those other things that you chose for all eternity, uh, but you are separated from God. Each of the punishments that Dante envisions in this work correspond to the very specific sin that the person was engaged in during their life. The punishment fits the crime. Um, it's worth noting here also that this work, The Inferno, is often taught in courses that are offered in prison systems, um, and that people who are incarcerated have often, according at least to my anecdotal uh, recollection, I, I've known some folks who have taught in that setting, um, have spoken very highly of this work and have really connected with it um, because of the, the uh, apparent justice of the crime. This is not just people with pitchforks randomly stabbing at, at the inhabitants of hell. So we begin <clears throat> with what are called the spiritually neutral. These are people at the very gate of hell. Um, here we have an image corresponding to this. Um, and these are souls who are entering hell. Um, and I believe that the uh, figure on the far right here um, depicts Charon. And Charon is leading them down toward the river where they will um, uh, enter hell proper. But they're, they're kind of on the edge of hell. Spiritually neutral here means you were kind of lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. You never really made a decision, right? You're just on the edge. Then we move on to limbo proper. Um, so limbo, oh, it's kind of a funny, funny story about, about limbo. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's really, well, okay, I, I have to tell you now. I have to tell you. So <clears throat> the uh, margin, <laughs> I, I was taught this in college, the, the, the margin of a paper in Latin is called the limbus. Right? And uh, at one of the earlier church councils, it was discussed by those present, what happens to the souls of babies who die before they can be baptized, right? And the question was not able to be decided. They, they just couldn't come to an agreement on it. And so they, as it were, or not as it were, I think literally wrote that in the limbus, in the margin of the document, um, and thus uh, as, placed those babies in limbo. Um, this was in one of the very early centuries of, of church history. Um, 
and, and from this placing of that question in limbo, uh, it, it came to be believed that there, there might actually be a place or a spiritual state called limbo, right? Uh, where you're, you're not really fully in hell, but you're also not in heaven. Uh, that, that's the case in short, um, uh, be that apocryphal story as it may, uh, of these so-called heathen philosophers or pagan philosophers. Remember, heathen uh, simply means of the heath or of the countryside, uh, people who historically uh, tended not to be Christian as Christianity was a, was a movement of the cities. Um, these are the heroes and heroines. These are the great philosophers, the great uh, figures of the ancient world, none of whom were Christian. Vir Virgil was here before he came to meet Dante. Um, they're not being punished, um, strictly speaking. They have a nice castle. They live there, um, but they, they just kind of sigh. They, they just spend their days wistfully drifting about, right? Um, so, so they're not experiencing um, ecstatic union with the source of their being, uh, Paradiso, the, but they're also not being actively punished. Um, interesting placement here by Dante. Um, the, the, the circle that we, that we looked at um, in some detail, um, this I guess would be the second circle after, after uh, the heathens, so-called, um, is lust. Uh, and, and here we meet the figures of Paolo and Francesca. Paolo and Francesca, and it is, their story is really captivating. Uh, what I want to focus on here, just briefly, um, is this image of their punishment, as it were. Right? So here we have Dante looking um, at, this, at this whirlwind. And Paolo and Francesca are, are united in, in embrace of one another. And they are being swept about in this whirlwind by the by this torrential uh, stream, <laughs> this blowing, this eternal um, uh, kind of uh, confl conflagration. I guess that's fire. I don't know. It it's no peace, <laughs> no rest. Right. And in a way, this really vividly depicts the punishment associated with the sin of lust. Right? Uh, on the one hand, you are eternally bound to this person for whom you had such a profound desire. Right? But there's, there's a bit of a twisting of it because when you are with a person, of course, and if you love that person, it's not that you want to be physically bound to their body for eternity. Right? You want to be with that person. You want to have an interchange of love and affection and adventures and times that you share. Um, so, so the very fact that they're bound together in this way is one portion of this punishment. Another, uh, the other uh, uh, dominant one being that they're swept about, right? So lust, as it were, when, when you're in a relationship, you're in a sexual relationship, you, you can lose, lose the thread. <laughs> you can find yourself, you know, being, being thrown about by forces, as it were, beyond your control. And again, maybe not as it were. Right? So here in this depiction of the, the circle of lust and the characters of Paolo and Francesca, uh, we have a really good example, I think, of Dante's fitting of the punishment to the crime. From that circle of, of lust, Dante proceeds down and down and down um, through the nine circles of hell to the center, and he finds Lucifer, Satan, encased in frozen water. Again, hell is as far, uh, the center of hell is as far as you can get from the love and light and heat and goodness, truth and beauty of God. Right? So, so it's frozen and dark. Uh, and uh, Lucifer, Satan here, is, as you see on the small image here, we'll have a bigger one in a moment, depicted chewing three people. That is Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ, and two people who betrayed Julius Caesar, Brutus and Cassius, as depicted in Shakespeare's famous play, Julius Caesar. Let's have a look at the passage, and then we'll look at a couple of images of this, this figure of Satan who looms so large in this most famous of the three books of the Divine Comedy. The emperor of the sorrowful kingdom stood, waist upwards from the ice, and I am nearer to a giant in size than the giants are to one of his arms. Think how great the whole is that corresponds to such a part. 
If he was once as fair as he is now ugly, and lift up his forehead against his maker, well may all evil flow from him. Oh, how great a wonder it seemed to me when I saw three faces on his head. The one in front was fiery red, the other two were joined to it above the center of each shoulder and linked at the top, and the right-hand one seemed whitish-yellow, the left was black to look at, like those who come from where the Nile rises. Under each face sprang two vast wings of a size fit for such a bird. I never saw a ship's sails as wide. They had no feathers, but were like a bat in form and texture, and he was flapping them so that three winds blew out away from him, by which all Cocytus was frozen. Cocytus here refers to that center of hell. He wept from six eyes, and tears and bloody spume gushed down three chins. So Satan is crying, he is chewing these three sinners, and he is flapping his wings, and his flapping of the wings is cooling the waters and the ice in which he is encased. Here you can see Dante and Virgil kind of perched up on that little uh, precipice looking at this figure of Satan with his wings uh, encased in ice. And here we have another image of Satan with the faces in color corresponding to the description in Dante's text, um, the, the chewing of these sinners. Well, let, let's go to this first, the three faces, right? So what do we have? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. So God is three, three in one, right? So in a way here, we have a kind of grotesque parody of God, right? God is three in one. Well, so is Satan three in one, but but in a weird way, in a, in a disgusting way, right? Um, and these, these sinners are being chewed by Satan, never to be actually consumed, right? And, and so these, this represents the deepest treachery, um, those who betrayed Jesus of Nazareth and those who betrayed um, Julius Caesar. Here's the <clears throat> very concluding lines of the Inferno. Uh, made it all the way through the Inferno. How are we doing for time there? Down there is a space as far from Beelzebub as his cave extends. Uh, and we should say, sorry, I'll, I'll start over. Um, Beelzebub is another word for Satan or Lucifer, right? So he's, Dante's just describing the location of this, of this cave. Down there is a space as far from Beelzebub as his cave extends, not known by sight, but by the sound of a stream falling through it. Along the bed of rock, it has hollowed out into a winding course and a slow incline. All right, so what's he saying? There's a little tunnel, right? Him and Virgil are gonna go up that tunnel, get out of hell. The guide and I entered by that hidden path to return to the clear world. And not caring to rest, we climbed up, he first and I second, until through a round opening I saw the beautiful things that the sky holds, and we issued out from there to see again the stars. So we go from this deepest pit of hell up through this opening, down this hidden path. Dante comes after Virgil, right? Again, Virgil is leading. Virgil represents reason here, right? The poetic art. And he brings Dante out, and Dante can now see the sky back again on the surface of the earth. So let's talk about the Purgatorio now, um, and we'll be a bit briefer uh, with these two works, um, as, as certainly the Inferno, as I said, is the most famous of the three, and our selections from these are also a bit shorter. So with Virgil, um, he begins at the beginning of the Purgatorio, his ascent of the mountain of purgatory. And spoiler, at the very end of the journey, um, he's near the very end, we should say, he is met by Beatrice herself. Uh, reading the slide, since Virgil has taken him as far as he can, now only she can lead him through the spheres of heaven to a vision of God. Um, I want to say that this image on the slide is by Sal 
I want to say it's Salvador Dali. I could be entirely wrong about that. This is by a famous 20th century painter. This image of Dante and Beatrice and their love for each other, the idea that human love can draw us inward to ourselves, our heart, right, and then up to the reality that we call God. This is one of the great features of this poem. I emphasize, I emphasize. Um, I want to look at just one circle, uh, not, not circle, uh, story, one level of the mountain of purgatory here, and that's the uh, prideful, the prideful. This will give us a little sense of what, what is happening here on purgatory. Let's read the passage and then we'll go on. Basically, this is a passage about people carrying stones on their back. Talk about why in a moment. First story of purgatory. Um, and Virgil, uh, to me, the heavy weight of their punishment doubles them to the ground. Look steadily there. You can see already how each one, each person, beats his breast. Right? O proud Christians, weary and wretched, who, infirm in the mind's vision, put your trust in downward steps. Do you not see that we are caterpillars, born to form the angelic butterfly that flies to judgment without defense? Why does your mind soar to the heights, since you are defective insects, even as the caterpillar is, in which the form is lacking? Right? So what is he talking about here? Let's take a look at the picture and we'll talk us through. Here's Dante and Virgil watching people carrying these stones on their back, right? Okay, purgatory is not just about punishment, right? It's about purging. It's about correcting something that is off. That's a miss, right? So if you're proud, you've got a posture like this. You're very proud, right? You walk straight and tall. It's not a bad thing always to have a kind of pride, right? We, we don't want to be self-hating, let's say, right? But there is a kind of excessive pride. And that's what these proud Christians had exhibited. They, they focused their energies on things of this world, maybe their status, maybe these were cardinals or bishops or popes, right? Leaders, holy people. Um, but getting caught up with that pride has put them in purgatory rather than in heaven. Right? And carrying the heavy stones is again, not a random pitchfork kind of punishment, right? The stone um, takes that high posture, right? And it bends them down. It physically brings them down. It prepares them to have the humility that is needed for them to leave the mountain of purgatory and to enter heaven. Now, this passage describes when Virgil parts ways with Dante, and that is the crucial thing that, that I've had us focus on here in the Purgatorio. Uh, we read, Virgil fixed his eyes on me and said, Son, you have seen the temporal and the eternal fire, and have reached a place where I, by myself, can see no further. Pause. Temporal fire, the inferno, right? Or the, the surface of the inferno. And the eternal fire, right, is what is happening in hell itself, as well as the kind of purging fires of purgatory. Um, uh, Virgil can see no further than this point of the purgatorio. Remember, Virgil is one of the virtuous pagans. He's in that first circle of the inferno. That's where he is for eternity, right? He can't take Dante any farther than this. Here I have led you, continuing, by skill and art. Now take your delight for a guide. You are free of the steep path and the narrow. See? There the sun that shines on your forehead. See the grass, the flowers and the bushes that the earth here produces by itself. This is the earthly paradise. While the lovely, joyful eyes that weeping made me come to you are arriving, here you can sit down or walk amongst all this. Tough construction there. While the lovely, joyful eyes that weeping made me come to you. That's Beatrice. Right? So basically, while we're waiting for Beatrice to get here, right, here you can sit down or take a walk. Do not expect another word or sign from me. Your will is free, direct, and whole, and it would be wrong not to do as it demands. 
And by that, I crown you and mitre you over yourself. A few things here. Take your delight for a guide. Your will is free, direct, and whole. What is he saying here? While your desire is misguided in the inferno, in the purgatorio, you can't trust your will. It's like Augustine in the garden, right? His will divided. You can't trust your desire and your delight because you're wanting the wrong things. But once you are purified, once you have made it, as they have, up the mountain of purgatory, you have purged all of those things, right? Now, all you need to do is do what you love. Follow your delight. Look at all these beautiful things around you, right? You can trust yourself now. Your desire has been rightly attuned, has been directed in the right way. And now you don't need reason. You don't need skill and art to take you further. And in fact, they can't take you any further. The only thing that can take you further is by following your will, which is free, direct, and whole, leading you now upward, upward to God. I crown you and mitre you over yourself. A crown for a king, a mitre for a bishop. That's the funny hat that a bishop wears, the kind of pointy hat, right? So what Virgil is doing here is giving Dante authority over himself, over Dante's self, to continue the journey beyond reason into the domain of faith, where his will is pure. Okay, here we have an image. Virgil is gesturing for Dante to continue there on the left. Dante will, will cross this river, the river of light, as it's described in our text, and he will meet Beatrice, right? He's ready to meet Beatrice because he doesn't want Beatrice in a physical, carnal way now, right? His desire has been purified. He's come up the mountain of purgatory. He's ready for a kind of communion of souls with Beatrice, and that will lead him the rest of the way on his journey to the Paradiso. With Beatrice, so now we're starting the third book, and we'll again, we'll wrap up right around one hour, goodness. With Beatrice, Dante moves through the spheres, should be of paradise, upward, nine spheres, right? Until he must part from Beatrice herself. There he meets St. Bernard, whom we mentioned earlier, who prepares him for the final vision of God in the space beyond the spheres, the Empyrean, right? So just as Virgil could take Dante only so far, as we said before, so too can Beatrice take Dante only so far. Beyond that, only Bernard with his devotion, his utter purity of devotion, is able to re reveal to Dante that image of God. Let's take a look at um, our first passage here. Um, this is describing um, the, uh, we have a description of the Virgin Mary that he encounters, um, the souls in heaven. Let's take a look. When the sphere which you make eternal through the world's longing drew my mind towards itself with that harmony which you tune and modulate. Right? So pause. Dante is being drawn by the harmony of this divine sphere. Right? God is drawing Dante. The novelty of the sound and the great light lit a greater longing in me than I had ever felt, desiring to know their cause, so that she who saw me as I see myself, opened her lips to still my troubled mind before I could open mine to ask, and said, you make yourself stupid with false imaginings, and so you do not see what you would see if you discarded them. You are no longer on earth, as you think, but lightning, leaving its proper home, never flew as quickly as you, who are returning there, right? So what are we saying here? Lightning, proper home. Dante is thinking in images, right? Um, false imaginings. He's expecting something of God. He's expecting something of the Virgin Mary of heaven, right? But those expectations are limited and they're tethering him to the earth. They're tethering him to the world that he knows, 
right? You are no longer on earth, but you're like lightning, you're quick to go to go back there, right? So you're being drawn on with this desire, this longing for heaven, but you're also being pulled down by these habits that you continue to have in your earthly thinking. This is like thinking that God is an old man in the sky, right? That is the notion that will lead all people astray, right? Because it is a it is a false imagining about what this tradition calls God. And here we have an image of Dante and Beatrice. This is before the final image of the, the Empyrean in its fullness, the image of God that we're coming to presently. But we have here the Virgin Mary and the Trinity represented by um, uh, Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the dove kind of in the, in the upper portion of the image here above Mary. Um, so Mary is kind of w welcoming Dante and leading him on to this uh, image of God in God's fullness, right? We'll read this passage. Um, this is uh, leading us now to the final vision of God. In the profound and shining being of the deep light, this is actually an image um, of, from Dante of what God looks like. Right? This is what God looks like. In the profound and shining being of the deep light, three circles appeared of three colors and one magnitude. So the same size, but three different colors all together. One seemed refracted by the other, and the third seemed fire breathed equally from both. Oh, how the words fall short and how feeble compared with my conceiving. He was able to conceive, to understand far more than he can say. And they are such compared to what I saw that it is inadequate to call them merely feeble. He has absolutely no words for this. It's not even enough, to, it's too much to say they're feeble. The words completely fall short of the reality of this vision of God. O oh, eternal light, who only rest in yourself and know only yourself, who, understood by yourself and knowing yourself, love and smile. God loves and smiles. Those circles that seemed to be conceived in you as reflected light, when traversed by my eyes a little, seemed to be adorned inside themselves with our image in its proper colors. And to that my sight was wholly committed. Right? So he's, he's looking at these circles. He's looking into them, right? Words are escaping him, but he's trying to describe what he sees. Here we have a well-known image of this circle. You see all of the souls in paradise swarming. <laughs> swarming sounds scary. Uh, uh, circulate, circulating around this central light, these three spheres, uh, or three circles rather, that that glow together. And we have here um, Dante and Bernard, his final companion, looking upon that vision of God. And this will be our last slide, friends. Like a geometer, and th these are the very last um, lines of the Paradiso and, and thus also of the Divine Comedy from Canto 33. Like a geometer who sets himself to measure in radii the exact circumference of the circle, and who cannot find by thought the principle he lacks. So was I at this new sight. I wished to see how the image fitted the circle and how it was set in place. But my true wings had not been made for this, if it were not that my mind was struck by lightning from which its will emerged. So he's approaching this vision of God like a geometer. He's still inclined to use his reason. He's trying to understand it. He wants to know the principle. How does this work? What is God? Right? But my true wings had not been made for this. Right? No creature is made with a capacity to fully know God as God is in God's self. Um, if it were not that my mind was struck by lightning, from which its will 
emerged, right? So that lightning here, before it represented a kind of speed by which his mind was falling short, here it represents a kind of revelation, right? That he can't understand it rationally, but he, he through this kind of flash, this insight, this revelation that we talked about, he's able to go that very last little distance, right? He's gone through this whole journey, and now he has to leave reason behind and contemplate and be with God, right? Last lines, power here failed the deep imagining, but already my desire and will were rolled like a wheel that is turned equally by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Power here failed the deep imagining, right? So even here, imagination plays such a crucial role in our apprehension, in our encounter with God. But his desire and will, remember, desire and will were rolled, were turned, right? And now we have, again, this image of circles, this image of the threes, right? Everything encased in this kind of intricate structure. Um, and we conclude with an image of love, right? The, the love is what turns the spheres of paradise. Love is what drove the people who were in purgatory to where they are. Um, love in a misplaced way um, and lack of love is what drove people in the inferno, right? And here at the very pinnacle, the culmination, the ending point of the whole divine comedy, um, we're again reminded of the stars and of the vision of those and Dante seeing them in their completeness and their fullness. Friends, thank you very much for your attention. We've discussed the structure of these three works, we've walked through the plot, and we've seen, I hope, some of the beauty, the harmony, the balance, the intricate structure in this just singular portrayal of the cosmos according to the Catholic imagination. I look forward to continuing our exploration of this rich tradition with you. Thank you.